Okay, considering that today is the 20th of Av, 20th of Av, these are the yard sites, the anniversary of the passing of the Rebbe's father. And it so happens that I was, I am named after him. I share his name with Yitzchak, that was father. So little, little uh, biographical sketches, if you will, on who the Rebbe's father was. So who the Rebbe's father was, just by dint of his last name, begins already uh, times without the Rebbe. And the last name, Schneerson, is comprised of two words, Schneerson, as in progeny, is that the word? Offspring? Progeny. Proge- progeny, progeny. progeny. Of Rabbi Schneer. Right, after the Alter Rebbe, the first Rabbi Rebbe, whose last name was Baruchovich, because his father was Baruch, um, was arrested and then vindicated. So the arrest ended up I imagine the government knew about him before, but it certainly put him squarely on the map of Russian politics and well-known amongst the courts of the czars and the high courts of uh, parliament or whatever the system was there. And especially after his interrogations and seeing his leadership. So he became uh, what's called a a select citizen, I think that's what it was called. The czar gave him a status as a unique citizen. And specifically his grandson, that's a Tzedek, who succeeded his son-in-law, Right, sorry, his son. Alter had a son. Mitlebo became Rebbe. Rebbe Dovber. Rebbe Dovber's sister had a son who married Rebbe Dovber's daughter. So he married his cousin. So he succeeded both his grandfather from his mother's side and his father-in-law, his wife's father, bringing the Rebbe before him. This is the Tzemach Tzedek, the Turk Chabad Rebbe, who is then that befalled that. The Alter had a son and a daughter. Well, more than children. But I, I need diagrams for these things. My, yeah. my, uh, you see my eye spinning? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Tzemach Tzedek married his cousin. Let's just put it that way. He married his cousin. Okay. And his mother and his father-in-law were both children of the Alter Rebbe. So he's, that, that's kind of why the middle Rebbe is called the middle Rebbe. Because yeah. he's in between his... Because it, it's all... He's in between his father and his son-in-law, who's also his nephew. <laughs> <laughs> At any rate, this is the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek was conferred, got this uh, title as honorary citizen, but the, citizen, the honorary citizenship that he got was hereditary. Which meant that all of his... Sorry. Tzemach Tzedek, that's the grandson. The third Chabad Rebbe, the grandson of the Alter Rebbe. Okay. His name, he's called, by, he's called Tzemach Tzedek because of the name of his Torah works, called Tzemach Tzedek, but his name is Menachem Mendel. The Rebbe is named after him, essentially. Okay. Menachem is the same numerical value as the word Tzemach, and Tzedek is the same numerical value as the name Mendel. So Tzemach Tzedek is, 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 is how he's referred to as the Rebbe of Tzemach Tzedek, that's how he's referred to by the name of his books. All of his books are called Tzemach Tzedek. Like Respond to Tzemach Tzedek, Maimarim of Tzemach Tzedek, etc. When two names have the same numerical value, yeah. does that mean that even though, like let's say someone's called Steve, someone's called Michael, but does that really mean that the two names are the same because the numerical si- value uh, is the same? The same, I don't know, but they're certainly connected. My, my grandfather's name is Menachem Mendel, so I named my son Semach after the Rebbe. I wasn't going to give my son the name Menachem Mendel because my grandfather's Menachem Mendel. Right. So I named him Semach as a kind of connection to the name Menachem. So if so it's the same name, I don't know, but they're... two names have the same numerical value. They're connected, certainly. They're connected. Certainly. Okay. Um, so this Tzemach Tzedek, the third Chabad Rebbe got her, was conferred a hereditary title of honorary citizen, which meant that all the sons, I think, I'm not sure about daughters, but certainly his sons, um, got this title of honorary citizen. So if you had the last name Schneerson in Russia, until the Communist Re- Revolution, that was an honorary title. It meant you were part of this uh, Jewish aristocracy, as it were. And the, the Schneersons had a certain renowned name in Russia as scholars and academics and whatnot. And then when the revolution happened and the communists came into power, having the last name Schneerson wasn't, wasn't honorary, but it was meant you were being persecuted just because you had the last name Schneerson. So there was father, who is a fourth generation from the Tzemach Tzedek. The Tzemach Tzedek had a number of children, a number of sons. The youngest of the Tzemach Tzedek's sons, Rabbi Shmuel, known as the Marash, became the Rebbe in Lubavitch. He had other sons who became Rebbe in other towns. Kapost and Yezhin. And I'm missing one more, I think. But the oldest son, Rabbi Baruch Schneer, who in theory could have 
taken the position of Rebbe, his oldest son, but his oldest son who was the oldest to have known his grandfather, which is the Rebbe preceding his own father, and his great-grandfather, the Alter Rebbe. Right, this is the Simon Selig's older brother, Baruch Nair. Are we following? Right. So, but Baruch Nair declined the position of being Rebbe and actually uh, put his weight or, or supported the position of his youngest brother, the Rebbe Barash, Rebbe Shmuel. And he stayed in Lubavitch following his younger brother, his youngest brother, as a Rebbe. And uh, this is significant in that the Rebbe Marash, the story goes, I'm not exactly sure about all the details, but the story goes that the Rebbe Marash said something to the effect of, Dara vi Yeshuva Hena, a fourth generation will come back. He's playing on a verse. And basically, what this meant was that four generations later, one of your, your offspring will come back to the position of Rebbe. And that's what happened. Rebbe Barashner's great 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 grandson is the Rebbe. So Rebbe Barashner had a son named Levi Yitzchak, who had a son named Baruch Shalom, who had a son named Levi Yitzchak, who had a son named Menachem Mendel, who became the Rebbe later. Right, so this Rebbe Levi Yitzchak is a great grandson of Tzimach Tzedek, who carries this lineage, and, and this, is, this, um, this is theme. So Levi Yitzchak is born in, on the 18th of Nisan, means the middle of Pesach, in Tafresh Lamed It's ni- uh, 1878, in, I think the city right, Podarovna, is the name of the city, small town, near Hummel, and uh, he was already known as a young child, as, a, as, a, as an Iloi, as a scholar, as a, he showed promise of great scholarship. He was of the first grade, later when he got older, he was the first grade of Tem Chetmim. Tem Chetmim is the Chabad Yeshiv that was founded by the fifth Chabad Rebbe, Rabbi Shalom Ber, and the first, I think he was the first class, maybe, certainly the early years of that Yeshiva, which I believe was a student there, and the Rebbe Shab, the founder of the Tem Chetum, spoke very, very highly of the student Rebbe Levik. Just to, to give you an idea, the first couple of years to be accepted into Tem Chetum, into this yeshiva, it wasn't the yeshiva where they educated students. It was the yeshiva for students who were already educated and wanted to get now further education after their... In other words, you already had to know all of Gemara and its comment, basic commentaries before you entered into Tem Chetum in the first couple of years. It was meant for people who were already well-versed in Talmudic scholarship, and now they're going to learn Hasidus and the ways of Hasidus in terms of Hasidic philosophy and Hasidic prayer and Hasidic thought. So, to give you an idea, they, did, they didn't, the first couple of years, they did not have a structure of what to learn for Talmud. Because you already know how to learn Talmud, go do it yourself. There was a structure for how to learn Hasidus. That they were, that's what they're being reduced to. So, if you entered into Chetum already in those days, it meant you were already of elite scholarship. And then amongst those, it's said that the Rebbe Hashab, the founder of Chab, the founder of Rebbe, is saying that this Rebbe Levik is a prize student that gives you an idea of who. Who who, who, who Rebbeik was so even what, at a young what's age. What's the difference between learning Talmud versus learning Hasidus? What's well, a different part of Torah with a different set of rules, a different set of understanding, a different Talmud is you're analyzing most of its legalities, okay. Jewish law. <clears throat> Hasidic, you're th- Hasidic thought, you're thinking of philosophy, Kabbalah, okay. and more importantly, you're thinking of a way of life in terms of how to contemplate during prayer and how to develop a certain love and fear of Hashem based on the ways of Hasidus. As opposed to just the technical, here's how you behave and here's how you don't behave of, of So one Talmud. would be like halacha law, and the other one would be more philosophy? Broadly speaking, that's correct, but there are nuances within that as well. Okay. But broadly speaking, you can say, you can put it that way. Okay, so Reb Levik, this prize student of Tem Chetumim, married the daughter of the Rav of a city called Nikolaev. The Rav's name was Remeir Shlemer and his daughter's name is Chana. They get married in the year Tafesh Samach in Sivan, right? In Sivan Tafesh Samach, that's 1990. Yeah, 1890. Yeah, obviously. 1890, not 1990, sorry. That would be very recent. Um, 1890, yeah. And Nikolaev, this is the Rav, Rabbi was the Rav of Nikolaev, he married the, the Rav's daughter. And there, he was supported by his father-in-law for many years and kept on learning. Don't know when exactly, but he got smicha from many uh, from m- many scholars at the time, including most notably Rabbi Chaim of Brisk. Chaim of Brisk was very impressed with the scholarship. There's a story of their of when he was getting shimush. Shimush means after you get smicha, which is when you get technically tested on the law, shimush is you sit in with the rabbi and you answer questions in the presence of the rabbi, and the rabbi corrects you to see if you can be an actual rav. 
That's what shimush is. It means not just to learn the technical laws, but to learn how to interact with people, learn how to actually apply the law you learned to actual situations. So there's a story goes that there was a, a few different people lived in a court, who shared a courtyard, and they uh, had a sukkah. They were sharing a sukkah. Now, when, you, when a few different Jews share a courtyard, you have to make what's called Erev Chatzedes. Erev Chatzedes is where all the people share food, share their meal. Prior to Shabbos starting, they share a meal. And when they... Um, and by doing that, they're making the courtyard... Well, they, it's more technical than that. They actually give the food to one person, thus making as if they all live in one shared space turning this courtyard, which belongs to a few people, into a private domain of one person that they're all sharing. So uh, one is able to make a challah and then bring it right, outside so, the house. That's correct. So one person bakes a challah on behalf of everybody, and the other or person people give them the food. Chicken and they all... yeah, yeah, so what's interesting is, they, these people forgot to make their Erev Chatzir, so they came to Reb Chaim Brisk and asked what to do. Reb Brisk said, ask Rabbi Levi Yitzchak, he's getting shimush now, that's the point, right? They asked the... Person saying there was a person going through the shimish process to answer the question. Reb Chaim Brisk, the Rav will see if he answered right. And Reb Levik said, the fact that they share a sukkah and they're all breaking with different parts of the meal already is their erev chatzeres. That was like a good answer. Right. Yeah. In other words, it's, it's even though they didn't do it before Shabbos, in the fact that they were anticipating to bring it all together to one meal, and we never talked about the story. This is a famous story of, of how they of Reb Levik getting smicha. Before, the, before Reb Levik became got an official position as a Rav anywhere in the year Tafresh Samal Beis, which is 1892. Oh, you're right. So yeah. Tafresh Samach is not 1990. It's 18. Uh, it's 1900. Yeah. yeah. That's what it is. Sorry. Yeah. 1900. That's because I think you said he was born in 1878. 1878. He could have been married 12. Then 12, at the age of 12. Oh, yeah. Right, right. Yeah, okay, 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 good, good. Yeah. So it's 1900. That's why I missed them. Yeah. Okay. 1900. Tafresh Samach. So two years later is when, first of all, when his first son was born, the Rebbe, he was born Tafri Samar Beis in 1902. But also the, that during that time, the Rebbe Ashab placed him on every committee the Rebbe Ashab found at the time. So at the time there was the Russian-Japanese War, and the Rebbe Ashab founded a, a VAD, a committee, to look after the Jewish needs of these Russian Jewish Russian soldiers. Specifically, most notably, was organizing, making sure they had matzah. And making sure Jews had matzah became like a, a, a centerpiece of Rebbe Levick's life. As we'll see later, how he went to Mr. Snuffish for that. So here, this is the first time when he was already on a board with his Rebbe, the Rebbe Ashab, to help the Jewish uh, soldiers in the Russian-Japanese war, helping them get, uh, get their, get their uh, matzah. Likewise, during that time, the Rebbe Shab was part of the committee to help Bayless, Menachem Bayless, you know, the famous, the last uh, Jewish blood libel. Familiar? Menachem Bayless is the last one to have a Jewish blood libel, and it was a big rash, it was a big tumult amongst the Jewish world, and many, many rabbis and scholars got involved. And along with that came, came um, rabbinic authorities were submitting um, papers showing their scholarship and that a Jew cannot have blood and thus disproving the need for blood in the matzah. That's what blood libels were. They would frame Jews for killing non-Jewish people to get to put blood in their matzah. And so the Rebbe Shab asked the Bledic to write a Kabbalistic dissertation to that, to that end. A Kabbalistic dissertation explaining why blood can't be put in the matzah. I mean, it's, like a, it's a clear verse, but still this is the way it did it, so the Rebbe did that. In 1909, he was asked to become Rav in Yakatinislav. Now, becoming Rav in Yakatinislav, so how, how old is the Rebbe at this point? He's born in 1878 and he's 1909, so he's 31? Correct. 31. 31. Yeah. He's my age. He's a very young man to be appointed as a Rav in Yakatinislav. Yakatinislav was a massive city. It was a huge central city on, on, a, on, the, um, on the water, so it was a port city. It was a huge metropolis of business and it was also very high percentage of Jews, even more than like Warsaw. Warsaw had some, like a half million Jews, but, it, but it was, I think it was like 50-60% of the population or something like that. Yakutinoslav was even higher. It was 80% Jewish. Yakutinoslav, something like that, some crazy number. And the reason is because it was in the Pale of Settlements, and it was a deal some years earlier, some Jewish businessman cut a deal with the Tsars, allowing him to open a factory there and to employ Jews to work there. 
So Jews came flocking there. It was a massive, massive uh, Jewish city. And in the past, they had had many towns in Russia that had a Hasidic rabbi and a non-Hasidic rabbi. And it so happened that both of those positions became vacant when they were looking for a Blavik. And first of all, he's 31 years old. Plus, he became the singular rabbi in the town, as opposed to just the Hasidic rabbi, which itself was a major thing. Uh, the Blavik's wife, the Rebbe's mother, Rebbe Tzanchana, in her diaries, which were le- recently, some of which were published many, much er- many years earlier, she gave her diaries to a magazine called the Yiddish Haim, where they did a uh, bio on the Rebbe's father. But later they found more of her diaries, and in her diary she writes that um, there, was a, there was a specific thinking of this big city that probably was not majority Orthodox. And even within the Orthodox, you had every sect. You had, and especially during that time, there was the Enlightenment coming along, so you had all kinds of other movements, not just Orthodox movements within Judaism, uh, secular Zionism and religious Zionism and religious non-Hasidic and religious yes Hasidic and this kind of Hasidic and that kind of Hasidic. And as a young rabbi who is of a very distinct Hasidic lineage, not just a Hasid of Chabad, but carrying the last name of Schneerson, to be able to bring the community together was a big, was a big deal. And uh, she writes there about the struggle she had to put up with. Specifically, there was one specific guy who actually came from Hasidic stock, but later uh, became a very secular Zionist. And it was around that time, 1909, when the Rebbe Ashab, the fifth Chabad Rebbe, who was very instrumental in, in persuading the community through letters to install Rebbe Levik as Rebbe, who also at the same time came out with a letter, came out with this public uh, view, strongly anti the secular Zionist movement at the time, which was sweeping Russia in mass. So this Zionist, this particular Jew, who was a leader of the Jewish community in Yekaterinoslav, was very much weary of Rebbe Levik becoming Rebbe in Yekaterinoslav, becoming the rabbi. Rebbe Levik, Rebbe Tzachana writes how she, he, he asked for a meeting with this Rebbe Levik. They spent six hours together and he came out all excited. This is our new Rav. So this is 1909. The Rebbe was born 1902. So when's the Rebbe Bar Mitzvah? In 1913. So no, sorry, um, 1915. Yeah. So it's 1915 is how many years after 1909? Six years after 1909. So six years later, Rebbe Tzanchana writes that by the Rebbe's Bar Mitzvah, when all the leaders of the Jewish community came together, that was the first time it was like a public display of all the different factions of the Jewish community coming together in support of their Rav. So it took six years for him to do that. Now it's individually he had rela- good relationships, but when you have a public event honoring the one Rav, and you see all and like all the different factions. You're here also. You're here also. That really solidified his position as as the rav there. The Blavik's house during the time became, if you will, the first Chabad house. The Blavik's house was famously. There's many different stories of different people, of neighbors writing about this. Uh, it was famously open to religious and secular Jew alike. Uh, the Blavik's sons would go to the local university and local Jewish high school and bring Jewish kids to give shiurim, to fabreng with them. Blavik's home was open, Yitzhak Kislev, the famous descriptions of his, how, of his house being open for some chastair to fabreng and after a kafas and shul. Uh, for Yitzhak Kislev fabreng, and where Blavik would spend hours and hours talking. And it was like, a, it was like, a, not much like an open Chabad house, they, they described this. Also during that time, there was the, the First World War is what year? 1914. It began, ended in 18. 1914. 1914. Yeah. So it's around this time. And the Jews, of Germany, I believe, were kicked out of Germany because they were suspected of being spies for the Russians. I think I'm getting this right. The bottom line is that the Ukraine had a huge influx of Polish Jewish refugees in mass, in hundreds of thousands. And where'd they go? Go to the biggest Jewish city nearby, Ekaterinoslav. So there was father, Blavik, and specifically his mother, Bitsechana, were very actively involved. Everyone talks about this, how we never saw his mother so active. And she was involved at the, in, in getting these refugees, making sure they have a place to stay, a place to eat. One of the Rebbe's teachers actually came from this. One of the, a big, it was a big Rosh Shiva who was a refugee who stayed in the Rebbe's house and taught the Rebbe for that, for that period in Yekaterinoslav. Recently discovered who it was, it's published in this new book. I can't remember, but. So that was another big thing that I believe it was involved in. And of course, later comes the communist revolution. Everything changes. Everything changes. And now, I believe he doesn't, doesn't just have to lead his community, but he has to lead his community in fighting the communists. Now, officially, the communists were 
They allowed religion, officially. But like everything, they controlled everything. Which meant that if you were in a religious leadership position, every move you made was watched, and they would make the conditions of the law. It's not illegal to be Jewish, but they made the conditions so difficult that it was almost impossible, and they were basically waiting for you to slip to arrest you. So just to give you two, three little snippets to give you an idea of how Rabbi Levick ran his leadership under communist, uh, the communist rule. One is on Rosh Hashanah, just to give you an idea of talking about the Rebbe being, the Rebbe's father being like the first Chabad house. On Rosh Hashanah, um, Rebbe Levick davened and organized for a 5 a.m. minion for the people who are going to go to work. Because you can't miss a day of work in communist Russia. You don't have to take a day off, especially not on Jewish holiday which meant that there's going to be thousands of Jews who were going to go to work, and if it meant no, not coming to Rosh Hashanah, and it meant not hearing the shofar, then so be it. So what did we do? No problem, make a minion before, that, before work starts. If work starts at 9, no problem. Our minion starts at 5, and we have a minion before. Thinking that way is like a very Chabad esque but not exactly classic Hasidic. Uh, one snapshot of how the Rebbe organized his community during communist time. Another, it's a famous story. The Pope came out with a um, with a statement against the communist regime, the, so- the Soviets, because they're oppressing religion. Now, the communists, it was a very terrible public relations, it was a bad thing. The Pope came out against the communists, it was a big deal. And uh, the communists wanted to to publish a counter-narrative that there is that we're, we're accepting a religion. So they collected rabbis in somewhere in, white, in, in, in Russia and basically compelled them to sign a paper saying that the Jews are fine. So they wanted to do the same, they wanted to do the same thing in Ukraine. So they collected all the Ukrainian rabbis in, I think it was Minsk or where is it? It says it here where the committee was. Anyway, it doesn't really matter. And um, Reblevik was invited as well to come and sign this paper, sorry, in Kharkov, to sign this paper, stating that uh, that the communists are treating Jewish are treating the Jewish religion okay. So the first thing is they offered uh, Levik a uh, first class train ticket to come to Tanya. Yeah, they're 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 schmooze, they're they're, what's the, they're buttering him up. You know, we're taking care of you. We give you a nice hotel, and he declined any of their things. Said I'm paying for my own trip. I'm, I'm not, I don't want to owe anybody anything. They arrived in town. And there was one particular rabbi who they knew was a mole. They knew he was a spy for the communists, which made everybody afraid to say anything. But the didn't care. He made a statement, forbidden to sign. You're love, it's forbidden to sign on a lie. But what are you going to do? There's a gun to your head. So what did he do? He found, he found someone in Kharkov who was going to travel to out of Russia. And he persuaded him to go to the papers in uh, the countries outside of Russia and publish and to get them to publish the fact that in Russia they're putting a gun to the rabbi's heads to make him sign this paper and he did and there was a big cart a big uh, like a write up in one of these big newspapers outside of Russia with a big cartoon of a KGB officer putting a gun to a rabbi's head which with the caption sign and that did a whole made a whole tumult and because of that other rabbis didn't sign and the whole thing was cancelled I mean this is like a now, of course, if the Blavik had what they called a black file already on him, certainly his black file just got increased and there was increased scrutiny on him. And the next thing, which was a clincher in the Blavik's dealing with the communists, was the matzah business. The, the Russian government, in their great kindness, decided that they are going to provide the Jews with matzah. Now, providing Jews with matzah meant that they were going to hire their own mashkich, which means they were going to be in charge of supervising the matzah, which meant that everybody knew this was a joke. This, no, you know, if the KGB officer says, "Look, we can't afford you throw out the, we can't afford to throw out this flower, make it kosher." What's the what's the what's the going to do? What's the supervisor going to do? Not say it's kosher. Says it's kosher. Not Ablevik. Ablevik said, "Unless I am the only one who has the keys to the factory, I'm not putting my stamp." If matzah is produced in Ukraine in, in Yakutinislav, and which was a big grain supply area, and it didn't have Ablevik's signature, everybody knew this was. Nothing. If Blavik's signature's on it, they knew this is legit matzah. The meant, the meant literally risking his life for this. And essentially, for those years, anybody in Ukraine and even farther out who ate kosher matzah was because Blavik was willing to put his life on the line 
and say, come what may, I'm not putting my signature unless I have the only, my, unless I'm the only one who has access to these, to these factories in Matzah. I mean, it's, it's an incredible, incredible thing. So finally in 19, uh, Tafir Sadiq test, that's uh, 1939, he's finally arrested, put from one jail to another jail, and the stories of him being in jail are, are incredible. They literally, the Russians had this thing about uh, getting, getting, the Soviets had this thing about getting uh, confessions. They didn't kill you unless you did a confession. That was part of their propaganda. So they would literally torture people. And 99.9% .9 of people caved and gave confessions. Now along with confessions come giving away others who are involved in what you're doing. And the would not do that. He would not do that. They literally beat him and tortured him. But he would not say a word. There's all kinds of stories where he's davening Shemana and he'd come in completely ignoring them. They'd be banging him on the head and he's davening Shemana and he's done. Okay, now I'm ready to go to, uh, to be interrogated. Uh, crazy, crazy wild stories. He was so, he was so uh, beaten and tortured that there's, there's two pictures we have of Rebbe's father. One was before he was arrested and one is a couple years later. So the one from before they had seen, and the one that came later came out, they got the picture sometime in the 70s. When Deborah got it, Deborah wrote in the bottom, this is my father, two explanation points, two question marks. That's how he was so beaten, his, Deborah like almost didn't recognize his father from how beaten he was. And he essentially died as a result of that, because after his arrest, he was sent to exile in, uh, in Chile, which is in the Far East. No Jews, no nothing. And all kinds of wild stories about the Rebbe's father not eating anything because it wasn't kosher and basically starving, taking the last bit of water he had to do to wash his hands instead of drinking it. I mean, like uh, stories that are like of a different, of a different, uh, of a different nature. And it's there. Well, first of all, when, when the Russians uh, arrested him, they also burned. Well, that's the story goes. It's possible that it still exists, but they burned all of the Rebbe's, Rebbe's father's writings. And they say the Rebbe's father's writings were very uh, elaborate and lucid both in Halakha and in Kabbalah. But we don't have any of that. All we have is that which he wrote when he was in exile in, in Chile, in a place called... Kazakhstan. Yeah, Chile is a town in Kazakhstan, is that right? I think so. So Chile is a town, not the country, not the state. Maybe. Anyway, when he was there and his wife found out that he was there, she traveled there with him and made um, ink. ink out of berries and that's how he wrote his notes on the margins of the books, which this is this is actually the picture of him uh, after his arrest, you can see he's not a very old man, this is he's born in 1878, and this is let's say 1940 so how, how old is he? 50, he's a young man 62 60. This is the other picture. This is earlier than this picture. And that's after, yeah. So it's only a couple year difference. But you can see already quite a difference in his, in his look. But here, I can show you a picture of his handwriting on the margin of books, something like this. So here it's in black and white, but if you get the originals, you can see it's in red, green, purple, Right. Depending on what kind of ink, this is his copy of margins of Tanya. Just to give you an idea of what kind of person Ablevik is, so they published here a, in the front a Rishima notes that Ablevik writes, and, um, and he writes, I, Levi Yitzchak, son of Zelda Rachel, have been sent into exile for five years to a place, Tzile, in the country of Kazakhstan, and I was in jail from, gives the dates, and then he gives a whole Kabbalistic dissertation based on his name, the numerical value of his name, the dates in which he was arrested, the number of locations in which he was arrested, and how they all link up Kabbalistically <laughs> to who he is and what his soul is supposed to do in this world. I mean, like, who does that? I mean, it's, 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 uh, it's wild. Like a whole, a whole dissertation on, on this. With sources and footnotes and locations and Midrashim and, and Zayhar connecting his name to the dates, to the places. Uh, it's, a, it's a wild thing. Anyway, after his, his officially exiled for five years, which meant that five years he's able to come back, but he was so weak and, and beaten and that the, uh, he, he basically moved to a small town called Amata, which is not far, became installed as the Rav there and died there from his wounds, essentially, 
on the 28th of Av in the year Tavshin Dalid, which is 1944. So 1878 to 1944. How old is he? 64, 66. 66 years old. When he passed away, the previous ever wrote a beautiful um, obituary on, on Rablevik. A lot of the details that I shared with you come from that obituary. And uh, just to conclude, to connect this all back to Matzah and to the Rebbe, I'll con- conclude with two things actually. First of all, they found in the, um, late, late, it's been rele- they have released the um, interrogation files of, of Rablevik. That's one thing the Russians were very methodical and very uh, marked down, wrote and everything. So they released his interrogation papers. And in there, they make reference to your son in Paris who's sending you Matzah. What's that all about? So this is some interesting connection to Matzah. They found a similar thing in Rebbe's uncle, Rebbe's brother, Rebbe Shmuel Schneerson, who actually married Rebbe Tzachana's sister. So brother and sister married brother and sister. And he was a Rebbe in a different city, not a big city, a small town nearby. And he also, in his interrogation files also, which also arrested for the same reason, because he's a rabbi who did some illegal activity. And in his files also talks about your nephew in Paris sending you Matzah. So the Rebbe, even in Paris, in university, is busy organizing to get his father, Uncle Matzah, I guess, and shared with others. Same thing with getting a sregim to them for sukkahs and other such things like that. And finally, I'll give you another final note, is that it didn't really get in time to get into the Glavik style of learning. Because we know that at one point, the Rebbe's teacher came home, brought the Rebbe home from Cheder and told the Rebbe, your son knows everything I know, I can't teach him anymore. Sorry, nothing more to teach him. He knows everything I know. And the Rebbe himself taught the Rebbe. And th- there are very clear links, even though the Rebbe quoted his father-in-law, his, his predecessor, the previous Rebbe, almost every single talk, but the style of the Rebbe's learning came very much from the Rebbe's father in various different ways, but it comes out in two specific ways that I can share with you. Number one is Diuk. The Rebbe's uh, insistence on if you're, going to give, if you're going to give an explanation on some passage, it has to fit with every single word in the passage. There are those who learn or are more liberal with the, with the wording of the comment, let's say the passage in the Gemara, and more concerned with the content. It's a style of pulpo or hakira, different types of ways of learning. But generally speaking, the words aren't necessarily so um, held to such scrutiny. What's the message the person, the Gemara is trying to say? And see if you can connect it with some other things or give some other explanations. Whether it fits exactly with the words, Many styles of learning are not so concerned with that. And for the Rebbe, that was like, what do you mean? If, this is what, if, not, if that's what it meant, that's what it would have said. So the precise wording, you see this in Rebbe's Rashi commentary, in his Kabbalistic commentary, in his Gemara, and his, in every type of commentary in Rebbe's, Rebbe's um, teachings, is diuk, the precise wording. Even when Rebbe would analyze his father-in-law's writing, they would also be like, why does this thing come first? Why does that come second? Why did he choose that word, not that word? That came very much... It's, it's clearly linked to the Rebbe, Rebbe's father writes that every word, is each, like Rebbe's commentary on Tanya, Rebbe's father's commentary on Tanya on the margins, which are very cryptic, right? His writings, I, m- I mentioned before that they say his writings were much more elaborate, but on the margins, you can't get that elaborate. It's only, it's very cryptic. But you can see there, most of his writing is, the Alt Rebbe wrote three words. Here he writes a vav, here he doesn't write a vav. Here he writes a vase instead of a vase. And here he writes a pata, I don't you know, like literally getting into diuk. And this is because of that, this is because of that, things like that. And you see that very much in Rebbe's writing as well, this diuk. In the previous Rebbe's writings and in the previous Rebbe's of Chabad, you don't find that, that analytics of such diuk. But don't you find that with the author Rebbe, he was like that? He was very brief in his writings. Yeah. Was so th- th- it's interesting you said, but that was writing, you do see that, where he'll, he'll analyze a patch of the Gemara in that. looking at the very precise language. And certainly, the Rebbeim wrote with precise language, but I'm talking about in their analytics of other texts. Like when they're analyzing another text, they analyze the specific words, they just talk about the content. They were very much analyzed every particular word and made that particular word express the general content. It's very, very interesting, yeah? So when I'm reading Torah Anthology, quite often I'll read where it says, well, here Hashem, you know, used this letter instead of that letter. It's the same word, but because yeah. he used, so it, it basically falls within that same. That's correct. Everybody will agree that right learning this way is very is the, the proper way to learn. The problem is it's too hard. It's much easier to be liberal with the concept, to 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 go along to go along with the concept and be liberal with the words, right. rather than try to 
instead of trying to make an idea that fits into the words, but look at the words to see if you can get the concept out of it. It's much more difficult to do that. It's much, it's much, much harder way of learning. But Rebbe, that's what Rebbe insisted on learning everything. That's the first thing which I. It probably also comes from the fact that I think that Rebbe, Rebbe Leibniz was very young as a mathematician. A lot of numbers. I think when, you, when you come from a mathematical scientific background, there's yeah. no room for, you know, every, like the numbers are very precise. You yeah, a period, a comma, everything is. So, you know, when you take now go from numbers to letters, the same thing, or yeah. words, it's got to be very. That's interesting. Yeah. Um, the second thing where you see there is, uh, you see clearly, there's a few different, there's a lot of different ways, but another one that stands out is uh, that everything is connected to the personality of the person, the names of the person. The name of the person, the date, and location where it happened. Everything is precise. Not just in Torah, but in the wor- God's world. I think by divine providence. So if this person said this thing, and his name is such and such, and this is his, bi- this is his bio, and this is his, where, where he lived, then all that is connected to why he said that thing in that fashion. And Nebuchadnezzar would do that all over in Gemara also. Like Nebuchadnezzar would make like uh, personalities out of, let's say, Rabbi Shmuel and Rabbi Kiva and talk about how their arguments match their personalities, their names, uh, their history. Uh, that was very much that was father also. So if you recall, I came and asked you that question yeah. a few months ago about a name okay. and personality because I've noticed in my lifetime that people with certain names, like all the Davids are like this and all the Jeffreys are like that. I don't know that I'm I don't know that I'm uh, expert enough to do that, but I'm certainly not, I'm not I'm not it's just something that I've I, I, I do you recall me asking you yeah. this question? So I don't, I, you were saying yes, like a name is like we call this a chair, we call this a table, we call you know, there's a Yeah, there's a famous line from the from the Al-Tareb in this in the in chapter one of part two of Tanya, which I would quote very often or often, which is the name that something is called by in Lashon the Holy Language, that is the divine life force that gives it, that animates it. This is something I've noticed like way yeah. through my lifetime. I, I've Correct. noticed that and, and now that I'm starting to, like, I, I see it more. Yeah, which is why, yeah, that's why I was saying that there's father writes this Shushima, my name, Levi Yitzchak ben Zelda, Rachel, and explaining how his name and his, is connected to his history, to his this, to his that, all with the details. So all of these things, not just the precision of the wording of Torah, but the precision of the one who's speaking, the context, and all of the stuff has to come together to match the content overall. Meaning, there's, there's one singular message, and all the details, every precise word, who's speaking, where they spoke, when they spoke, all have to match up in this perfect uh, symmetry. And that's very much um, the Rebbe do, following along with the way his father, Rebbe would learn, which leads to another point, there's many such things, but also this idea that all parts of Torah are connected. That would often say, you know, the classic way of learning is there's a simple reading of the verse, okay, and then there's a drush, an exegesis, and they don't have to necessarily match. Whatever, this is the simple, this is the, and that's fine. But for the Rebbe, it's one Torah. So if there's five different interpretations to one text, that means all those five different interpretations must have a common overarching theme, which explains all of them and why they're all connected and how each one contributes to the general whole and they share one common message and connect it to the person, to the location, to the numbers, to the thing, all these things, all these details coming together. Debo was very much, uh, spoke very much like that and very, very much followed the way his, um, his one father root. did. There's one root. One root. From the root comes One bread. Torah and therefore all, that's correct. But learning that way means you have to, it's, it's, you have to do two things at once. You have to be able to get to the essence of what's being said and be aware of every single one of his details that all matches up. Some people can do one, not the other, or partially one, partially the other. But to get that synergy between all of them is a very unique way of learning. It's very unique that someone could do that. And this is, Debra excelled in that. I mean, this is, all their talks are like that. All their analysis. You wouldn't find just by reading Gemara, right? You Sorry? Wouldn't, you wouldn't find a symmetry with all those levels of learning. After enough learning Gemara, maybe yes, but... Uh, you know, if my teacher brought me brought me home and told my father I knew everything, maybe I'd be there. But I, so far, my teachers still have a lot more to teach me. So, <laughs> so I'm not sure I can get there. Notwithstanding my name being the same name, but uh, at any rate, so that's a little bit about there. His father gives you an idea of where they came from, and uh, who this incredible, incredibly great uh, personality was, Rabbi Levi Yitzchak Schneerson. All right, have a wonderful day, everybody. Thank you.